friends through eternity, loyalty, honesty. We'll stay together through zombie takeout. And welcome to episode 537 of Zombie Take It. Zombie Take It. Wait, wait, you are here, all over the place, dear. As I sit here twitching. Last week you said it was 336 when it was 436. What did I say? This week, this week you just said it was 537 when it was 437. I apologize, folks. It is 437. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was running a fever when we recorded last week. That's true. I, and I didn't. I, I was gonna say something, but I decided not to because we were just getting off the ground. But then when you did yeah. it again this week, it was kind of like, wait a minute, is this, like, is this a bit? I'm, I'm calling you out. I, I was running a fever last time. I'm yeah. like ninety five percent now. It's like that last five percent that takes forever to get out of your system. But and this also happened on the hearing. I made some mistakes. Um, I'm dyslexic, and so when you're you're feeling unwell, the, that sort of thing, you know, comes out a lot. So that's why I've been messing that up. So yeah, once again, episode four three seven of Zombie Takeout, the B movie and cult movie show. I'm John. Hello, I'm Scotto. And without any further, well, before we get to this week's movie, a little further ado from Bodo, some tweets this time instead of a voicemail. Um, <laughs> he said. At Zombie Takeout, why is it you're doing a night raid and there's one ninja dressed in white? Uh, (laughs) I did a little research on the white ninja costumes or uh, uniforms. They were used for snow. Of course. Yeah, I I wasn't sure. I I wanted to check if there wasn't kind of any rank thing. It was just for snow camouflage. I pointed that out to Bodo and said, yeah, I didn't see any snow in that scene. And he replied, there was snow in the the scene. It is Miami. (laughs) Well, I think in this case it was uh, a lot of confectioner sugar. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> he then said, uh, even though he used his own students, I think they were better actors than the ones in House 4. <laughs> uh, then, did they super the drums and cymbals together? Super cool. I'm not sure exactly. I think because it was a Simmons electronic kit that didn't move normally. Um, and then finally, Miami Connection. If you get rid of the 50% music videos and training montages, you have a nice, oh, sorry, 50 minutes of uh, music videos and training montages, you have a nice 45 minute short film. I'd give it one and a half brains. <laughs> and without, but, and you, once again, without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1987, the infamous Miami Connection. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary. We forgot to do our sponsors beforehand. This is the first time we'll be here. We're going to surprise each other with our sponsors. (laughs) Sponsored by by Obvious Exposition. Singing, it really doesn't make it any better. And also brought to you by Post-Brother Killing Makeouts. Oddly (laughs) enough, a category missing from Pornhub. Yeah. All right. So, oh, I mean, this... This one just pretty much writes itself, doesn't it? We have um, we ha- we start off with a um, a coke deal, uh, an exchange that is being uh, disrupted by ninjas in the middle of somewhere in Miami. Which, hmm. by the camera position, my expertise would say the Atlantic Ocean. Somewhere there, yeah, maybe the Gulf. <laughs> Stranger Things did the same thing, though. Some place in Chicago, and it's well, like really I, I think on it, the lake. <laughs> it was filmed in Orlando, if I recall. Well, you're right, right. Um, but that's supposed to be in Miami because that—that's where the title comes from. Mm-hmm. They had the Miami connection at the very beginning, and right. um, of course, Miami is then never heard from or seen again <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, because the ninjas uh, steal all the cocaine. Uh, you you first feel that the, the ninjas are good guys, but then you realize they just stole it. Well, because you know they like cocaine and they like making money, mm-hmm. and uh, especially well, that's Florida. Yeah. Um, right. So the, most of the action of this film does actually take place around Orlando, um, which is you know the Kissimmee Cavaliers. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, 
and uh, it's this uh, synth rock band called Dragon Sound that we were introduced to, but uh, it's all about really preaching the word of Taekwondo, <laughs> and um, they, they you know are incorporating into their act as much as humanly possible, and uh, they seem to be very well liked for some reason in the the Miami club or the Orlando clubs. I think it was all set in Miami. It was just filmed in Orlando because that's where they were from. No, because they talk about uh, Central Florida University. Oh, okay. So, yeah, once that opening scene was done, we were out of Miami Hmm. and up in Orlando. And they were moving the drugs up from Miami to Orlando. Ah, Okay, I missed that part of the dialogue. And uh, so, right, the the head ninjas from Miami and then the... uh, the Ahmadinejad looking guy is from is like the the guy from Orlando who you know gets buys the drugs mm. from the head ninja and uh, well, and thank you for for keeping me on track here for this awesome plot mm. uh, we we uh, we turn we there the ta- this Taekwondo team somehow gets caught in the middle of this drug dealing uh, team. Mostly because the leader's sister is dating one of the band leaders, and or Taekwondo well, leaders the, really the, wasn't really the, band leader. The Taekwondo guys are also a band. And yes, the bass player is dating the sister of the leader of not the ninjas, but the gang who's moving the coke. Right, and rather than trying to keep a low profile and just uh, whatever you know makes you happy or whatever, he decides to be that guy that said my sister shouldn't date anybody, and uh, pretty was... much starts. If you look at it, they they start the trouble and draw the attention to themselves that they did not need to do. He's one of those guys who has that really creepy fixation on his little sister. Yeah, um, and. Uh, because they brought this attention to themselves, of course, it pretty much escalates into a war with most of them uh, getting killed in one way or another, or at least pretty badly hurt. Mm-hmm. And they wind up having to call these ninjas in. Um, we also are introduced to a few subplots. Um, one of them, uh, and, and it was really funny, because after the three house movies when that we've seen, uh, I really thought that this wasn't going to pay off mm. when they started introducing, start talking about this guy and looking for his father. After the last three movies right. that we've done, I, I assumed that was just going to go nowhere, but they actually had a payoff for it, which was shocking. Mm. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the other subplot, but I um, The it restaurant away. owner. Oh yes, that plot went nowhere. That's no. what I can write. They 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 do the same movie trope of the immigrant uncle owning a restaurant, and of course it gets fucked with. But then he like fights them all off yeah. himself without and them having to help him. That's it. Um, and yeah, we never see or hear from this guy again. He was played by the co-director, so it was a cameo. Oh, I see. And of course he's a martial arts guy, mm, so yeah. he needed to get a little in. He was uh, Richard it's, Richard Park, who's done a ton of martial arts, directed a ton of martial arts movies. And so uh, they they have, of course, the final confrontation with the ninjas, and uh, hilarity ensues. Mm. Now, the film came about after prolific martial arts director Richard Park, aka Park Woo Sang, saw YK Kim on a Korean to- on the Korean talk show Meet at 11 p.m. in 1985 where Kim was promoting a book about Taekwondo. Park met Kim, convinced him to make a film. Park had conceptualized the story while watching the interview. <laughs> so, martial arts director sees this interview with this guy who's this, who's a, you know, honestly is a Taekwondo master, and, you know, decides, I, you know, this guy's so passionate about it, his, his art, you know, it, it, I want to make a movie with him. Then he puts the martial artist in charge of the film as the director and co-writer. That's, I think, <laughs> where it went wrong. Um, now, but, was there really a writer to this? Because, come on. It, well, the the I, the story was co-written by Park and Kim. 
I think they brought another okay. writer in later. Um, I, I've been watching interviews and things about it all day. Um, the um, uh, I forget his oh ja- Joe Diamond, who played Jack the drummer, talked about being roped in as like the production coordinator and then like one of the co write one of the writers later. <laughs> It was very much an independent production. Um, it opened to poor box office scathing reviews and is long, no. had, was long forgotten until 2009 um, when Jack Carlson, a programmer at the Alamo Draft House Cinema in Austin, Texas, happened upon a seller on eBay who was selling a cop an, a 35 millimeter print. Um, Carlson had never heard of the film, bought it for 35 bucks. In April 2010, he screened the film at the Draft House, became a wildly popular cult uh, hit. More screenings took place to packed theaters. He called YK Kim about distributing it. Due to the film's failure uh, being a you know, painful experience for him, Kim uh, originally th- said no, he thought it was a prank. Uh, eventually, he relented and saw that his film had become a popular midnight movie 25 years later. That's so, amazing. Yeah. I, I just, uh, and the reason why I say, you know, was there a writer? Because you could tell there are a lot of scenes where they clearly just had lines that they had to say. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when they said it, they weren't quite sure if it got caught yeah. on camera. So they say they repeat the line again. Mm-hmm. There. So there's a lot of that happening throughout this and of course, it's hilarious because you, you know, as a filmmaker, you, you recognize that the, it's the a band, lot of just improvised scenes. YK Kim and and the band members um, are all very skilled martial artists. One of them is a very skilled musician. The lead guitarist, um, Angelo Gennati, I think his name was, yeah. actually does play guitar. He and Kathy Collier, the the singer, wrote all of the music and demoed it. I think they probably recorded all of it. Um, so I refer to him as Mullet John Oates, by the way. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. But none of them have any business acting. <laughs> now, the opening is like a low budget episode of Miami Vice. Yeah. Like it oh, has that whole Miami Vice feel to it. That's clearly what they were going for yeah, when yeah. they even made this. And just then to get this started, a Miami, a martial arts Miami Vice. Yeah, exactly. And then the ninjas show up, and it gets weird. Um, yes, it's like wait, what? Though they use the gore budget very sparingly, I don't. I think they were being careful with it. But when they use it, they use it. Yes. One guy takes an axe to the head. He's got this big gore, you know, gory wound. Um, I love that a shuriken to the neck killed a guy. <laughs> Um, the fight choreography is really worth the price of admission, I think. Uh, I mean, and then you get some guys that they're not sure they're on camera in those oh, yeah. fights, and they're kind of like posing with their fists up just in case they are, even though they're clearly dead center of the shot in the right. back. Oh, so there were things like that that really just, mm-hmm. I, I was almost falling out of my yeah, chair yeah. laughing. It's a, The fight scenes are brilliant. The rest is great unintentional comedy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and with the white uh, ninja costume, I think they thought it was a status thing because it was the leader who wears white. Yes. Um, you put that in quotes, leader, because at the end, mm. it, it's a little confusing because they use a very obvious stunt double. Oh, yeah. Because he's in, and in a ninja costume. Like, so they still have to fight the leader, right? And then I'm like, oh no, that was supposed that, to have been the yeah, leader. Yeah, yeah. Even though he, you could see the beard yeah. <laughs> underneath. I think mm-hmm. it was really the other guy. The I brother. think it was um, the brother yeah. in the costume. Who did the stunt, yeah. Yeah. And then the theme song is like some Adult Swim parody. <laughs> it basically lays out the story of the movie. And, Which is um, where I got the idea of uh, Intrepidus Pugs, because right, right. all, all the music is just so on the nose. <laughs> At one point in the middle of the film, they do a song called Against the Ninja. Right. So it's one of the weirdest parts of the movie, because they're singing about something that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> and they wrote a song about something 
that will happen in the future, but has not <laughs> happened yet at this time. But we'd seen the ninjas. We knew they were the bad guys. It was a foregone conclusion at that point. Of course. We as the audience saw the ninjas. They have yet to take on the ninjas. <laughs> and there's this conversation at the club. I think it's before they get to the, just before we hear the accursed song that you quoted in the intro. <laughs> the song really does make me twitch. Oh, man. Uh, um, it's the best. Where they're talking <laughs> about moving coke without any coding. Right outside yeah. this club, they're talking about moving cocaine directly. It, it's Wouldn't they be, you know, calling it the stuff or the product or... I mean, I've never been in that business, but it just seems the obvious thing. If you're talking about illegal things, you code it a little. Yeah, you know, I knew someone that, you know, shirts and, and pants and uh -huh. stuff, you know, right. they're different things. And they performed, and I can't remember the proper word, I apologize, but in their taekwondo uniforms. Of course. Now, yes. wait a minute. Did I miss... I, I didn't want to go back and, and rewatch the scenes but did i miss the guy getting fired for them to play no that happened before the film okay because it's like this guy talking about this thing as if we'd seen it throughout most of the film and i'm like wait what <laughs> who is this guy what is this it's like you 70 sam sounding motherfucker <laughs> and that's one of the subplots. The local band lost their gig at the club to Dragon Sound, and they go after Dragon Sound, and there's this big street fight. Um, and then, of course, they team up with the drug running gang and the ninjas, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but one of the other hilariously bad parts, as a musician watching this, um, Angelo Donati, an actual guitar player, from what I understand, actually played at least the guitar, and I would assume bass on the recordings. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming the drums are programmed. I don't know who played the keys. Um, but the guy who actually played them, he was good. To, he was fun to watch. But uh, YK Kim's guitar miming was just hilarious. <laughs> Vincent Hirsch, um, John, the bass player, was doing his best. I mean, it, I could tell he couldn't play, but he was he was at least trying. <laughs> you know, the... The, the drummer and the keyboard player were trying. Like, if you're a musician, you can tell they're not doing it right. Yeah. But, you know, to, to a layman, they're, they're, it's passable. But YK Kim's guitar miming was just hilarious. But I, I'm i sorry. I could not pay attention to anything else but these lyrics. <laughs> well, yeah. I, 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 of, of that song, I say, this is when the true horror of the movie becomes apparent. It is like one of the greatest train wrecks uh, I've ever seen. Because, I mean, it, it's. I had to go and Google the lyrics immediately, honestly, mm -hmm. and, and have them all in my notes. It's like and a it's two section just... th thing, like a chorus and then another section after that, and that just repeats. Right. Right. Yeah. right. It's that, 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 that was the chorus that we did at the beginning. Yeah. But just, I mean, it's. It's almost like a Lonely Island song, too. You know, like for <laughs> friends. You know, only they're being serious. And musically, for 87, it's, it's you know, standard pop. Oh, yeah. But, right. you know, and, and against the ninja, musically, at that age, honestly, I would have liked back in the day. Um, kind of a hard <laughs> rock song. Um, but the lyrics were just, <laughs> you know. Um, and when then, I'm weak, you make me strong. <laughs> Please no. I know I can depend on you to show the way and see me through. If you've ever heard Clarence Clemens and Jackson Brown's You're a Friend of Mine, it's a similar horror. We're on top because we play to win. We'll make our dreams come true. Well, that, that last line I, I won't get into the homoeroticism of, but... <laughs> There's nothing we can't do. And then it's kind of a payback for having to do all the house series, okay, I think. Fair <laughs> and then after the club scene, we get to a scene in a computer science class. Now, classroom scenes can be interesting if there's a good debate to be had. Hell, Dead Poet Society was like half in a classroom. Right. You know, um, what's the one with Matt Damon? Um, that, that, um, good Will Hunting. Hunting. You know, classroom scene can be good. But 
I can't imagine a good scene in a computer science class. <laughs> in a programming class, specifically. Uh, but this is still better than... Um, oh, uh, what's his name? Than the... Uh... Using the college, the community college oh, for yeah. classes. For... Um, yeah, brain. Um, but <laughs> the whole point of this computer science class scene is so that Vincent Hirsch, jo John, the bass player, can show up, mug for a few minutes to his girlfriend to try to get her out of the class. And then we get this annoying sob story from her that has no purpose. <laughs> Except to maybe explain why her brother just became a thug. I guess. I mean, right. It's all very weird. It's, oh, I don't like my brother. And then it's like, oh, my brother's coming to, uh, to pick, pick me, me up. up right now. Yeah. You know, the, just the dialogue is so unrealistic. Mm -hmm. It's not like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, my brother's kind of an asshole. You know, he's not, he, he's a, about to pick me up if you want to meet him, kind of thing. <laughs> it's sort of these separate sentences. Mm -hmm. And then the brother shows up. Of course, he's pissed off at the bass player for dating his sister because he's got this unhealthy attachment to his sister. And he slugs the bass player. And, and the band rides up just after that. There's a whole standoff. Um, um, Mark, Y.K. Kim's character, manages to talk it down. But here we have the rather obvious, like, okay, this is why they're going to butt heads. <laughs> Right, I guess they couldn't do a fight scene on the uh, in this in this college parking lot. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, and whenever it cut to the ninjas, I was expecting it to turn into a decent martial arts movie, <laughs> but then it cuts back to the band. Right, and then at the point it seemed like you know the coke ninjas were kind of a red herring. Yeah. Because we see the ninja leader at the club once or twice, but he's got glasses and his body language is completely different. I, it took me a while to realize that was him. <laughs> he's just this Asian guy hanging out with, with the brother. Took me a while to realize, oh, that's that's the leader of the ninjas. It's a very weird montage of them partying. You yeah. know, it's so Florida, oh, too. <laughs> the Sturgis scene, yeah, that was ridiculous. Yeah. It was just this biker rally in the middle of the movie, and it made no sense. No, no, it did not. <laughs> but the fight scene when the old band tracked down the new band, and there's they got like 40 people against five. <laughs> right. And the band wins. Like this, the group of five, you know, um, Dragon Sound somehow wins. They some these five guys somehow take down like eight to ten each. I mean, it's it's pure, you know, martial arts movie tradition. Yeah, of course. So you know, and of course, the point was they weren't exactly skilled fighters, right? Um, and these guys were but, like surgical with their kicks. <laughs> what oh it cracked me up though is John or Vincent Hirsch mm -hmm. in two fight scenes. He runs away for some reason, gets chased all the way. You know, to some other part of the the fight, like away from the main mm -hmm. action, yeah. and then turns around and beats the shit out of everybody. <laughs> like, well, why? Why did he do that? <laughs> to avoid ads, you know, he drew he drew a certain number of them off from the group, so he didn't get you know more added to the fight, and then just took down the ones he was able to pull off. <laughs> um, it was a good strategy. I guess it makes sense, actually. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah it was a good way. strategy. Um, I just, it was too bad this wasn't a better movie because I think it could have done a lot to popularize Taekwondo. Uh, come on. What more could they do? They had a song about, you know, Tai, Kai, Tai. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Taekwondo was one of the, it was the art that didn't get a lot of play back in the day. You know, really? karate and I, kung fu I always did. I remember hearing a lot about it. I mean, I guess not movie wise. Yeah, I mean, in the mainstream media, it didn't get but, a ton but, of play. I felt I heard a lot about it, you know, like football players oh, yeah. were like learning it to, right. you know, use it on the field right. and stuff. But, uh, you know, in the movies and TV, it didn't get as much play as, you know, of course, karate and, and kung fu did. And, and, you know, it would have been nice if this was, you know, if this had been able to, to give it that boost. Um, ah, they think they were just trying too hard to sell it here. Yeah. Um, it just wasn't enough else in the movie to sell it. Um, 
Um, then we get to Jim, the keyboard player, getting the letter about his father. <laughs> oh my god! He gets oh my god! The now, first at letter. This point, at this point, I'm actually writing a note that they didn't, you know, lamenting that they did not write a script. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you might want to consider writing a script. I start writing. Mm-hmm. And then he gets into that little monologue of his, and I'm just like, oh my god, on second thought after hearing that, don't. <laughs> don't. Don't write any dialogue. Go back to the improvisation. That has to be one of the most awkward scenes oh, yeah. it's I've not just the ever writing. seen. Maurice Smith, who played Jim, I think did an okay job with that emotional stuff. He was believable. Um, right. But, but it's what he was saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it starts off with, you know, of course, the band all live together. And, yes. and John is playing keep away with this letter. He finally gets it out of his hand, opens it, and mentions it's about his father. At this point, he says, you know, it, for, for some reason, I, he, he thinks he's not never going to meet his father. It was bad news. And it's this incredibly hilariously melodramatic scene that none of them have anywhere near the acting jobs to pull off. Right. Except, like like I said, Maurice Smith was believable, you know. But the rest of them are just kind of standing there staring at them at him. It looked like they were going to start singing doo-wop to back up his speech. <laughs> I was just, oh my god, I can't, I I couldn't even look at the screen. I had to like <laughs> look away. It was just that uncomfortable. The whole like, my my god, someone wrote this and then somebody else thought it was a good idea. Mm. Cut from that incredibly melodramatic, uncomfortable scene to the most cliche '80s beach scene you can imagine. Right. Paired with the accursed song. <laughs> like it was an 80s music video for like f- longer than a video should have been <laughs> and every just cl- beach cliche from the 80s and then right in the middle of the movie we get a martial arts solo <laughs> and yeah this is obviously a scene that did not need to stay in but because the whole point of this movie was to sell taekwondo yeah, yeah. they they had to do a scene of them just practicing well it starts with like a couple of minutes of yk kim just solo just in yeah. kata and then he brings in john and and J- jack the drummer and you know they start help they start attacking him to show off different things and i think he breaks a couple of boards or whatever and it's basically an exhibition in the middle yeah. of the film and right. then there's this incredibly awkward conversation between the three of them over lunch about how you know jack doesn't want to play the club anymore because you know the that band attacked them and then you know they try, they console him a bit and then he has this he hatches this plan where they're going to play all over the world and everybody's kind of, you know, home, nationality, home country. You know, John's Irish. They'll play on, you know, play in Ireland. Tom, the guitarist, is Italian. They'll play Italy. Jack's Jewish. They'll play Israel, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I was expecting someone to turn to the camera and start just talking directly to the camera. In fact, YK Kim almost started doing that, really. Uh-huh. It's really an international thing, this taekwondo. <laughs> Yeah. Thing is, I mean, they were a bit old for that conversation, but playing in high school bands, I had similar conversations. You talked, you said, we'll play in all of these different locations and then visit Taekwondo. Well, not the Taekwondo part. Not the Taekwondo gig. part, but, you know, the playing in different con- you know, bang- countries. Yeah. I mean, that is that, a dream. Like, almost made you... me fall out of my chair yeah. again, too. And they're like, and we'll visit Taekwondo centers after every part. gig. Yeah. I yeah. was like, oh, my God. Yeah, they, they were definitely trying to push the Taekwondo, yeah. And at one point, um, Kim, Kim's Mark, like Kim says, in Korea, everybody practices Taekwondo. Yeah. Um, I looked that up. Not exactly accurate. It's an exaggeration, but most no. men 
are trained in it either, you know, in school or in the military. It's very popular over there. It's like the national sport and everything. So it wasn't nearly as much of an ex exposition or, or an exaggeration as I thought it would be. Then we have the fight at the the uh, diner. Um, you know, a bunch of it, assholes, you know, try to do a dine and dash. The um, diner owner, who's kind of down on his luck, walks out and just cleans the floor with them as the band is rocking up they they want to help but he's like no they're done already right that that is one of the fakes of the movie there are a few fakes that they get over where you mm -hmm. expect them to come and rescue him and instead no he, he just, took just takes them all by himself there is a song that kicks in it's just a little interstitial music right after that scene in the diner because they go in and eat of course afterwards yeah that sounds a lot like take me home I don't remember. I think it was mostly the drum pattern, but yeah, they kind of ripped a little bit of Take Me Home off for the, yeah. the score. Because this was a couple of years after um, No Jacket Required. Yeah. Uh, it is the 80s. But I honestly can't tell like which is worse, the acting or the music. Ooh, it's a tough call. I mean, I don't know. I, I would say the music. The music is really just monumentally... <laughs> Well, I wasn't laughing at the music. I was just kind of shuddering at it. The, the bad acting was kind of amusing. And, I mean, it's the power of the night. Like, yeah. only it's not funny. It's <laughs> ridiculously it's 80s. Funny. And cliche 80s. The thing is, the movie had a weird effect on me. Because watching it, I watched it last night. And, I mean, it, I, had a, I had a good time with it. I enjoyed the action scenes. I got a good laugh out of the rest. Today, I kind of found myself developing more and more affection for it. Oh, yeah? Like, it just squeaked by a recommendation last night. Today, I think I might up my rating. Like, I, I kind of enjoy it more afterwards. After seeing it, it's kind of odd. Um, but there's a, right after that random biker rally we were talking about, like, the only nudity in the movie Yeah, is some random weird Sturgis scene. Um, <laughs> we get the scene where, Tom, you know, it's the middle of the night and the band is just kind of settling down and Tom is writing a new song. And this is a thing that only musicians will get. They're a rock band. Tom is writing a new song on manuscript paper, <laughs> notes in, on manuscript without an instrument on hand no noticeably. He didn't, his guitar wasn't near, you didn't see a keyboard. He hands it to Mark. Mark glances at it for two seconds. That looks good. Yeah. <laughs> Not only are they skilled martial artists, they're apparently ridiculously trained musicians who apparently play in a pop band for some reason. Well, as one of the, uh, the, the improv lines is, we're going to be the next Beatles. But the Beatles probably <laughs> couldn't even read music. I mean, they were moderately skilled pop musicians they were not trained like that why they're going to be the next beatles because they are even better come well, on i mean these guys in terms of training would put dream theater to, to shame <laughs> <laughs> but they're playing cheesy pop music um i don't get that um i mean i get it it was just you know not nobody thought a musician would take a look at this and uh, judge the scene but <laughs> right <laughs> and now tom is kidnapped I missed that scene entirely when it first happened. Oh, really? I was distracted by my notes, I guess. I was typing. I had to run it back. Wait, Tom was kidnapped when did that happen? Um, <laughs> we never got the scene where they discovered Tom was kidnapped. Right. We, we don't get any of that. It just... <laughs> they, he, they come for him. Yeah, Tom is hauled away. And suddenly, you know, he's being tortured by the bad guys and, and you know, the band has, you know, has to come and rescue him. Um, got some great gore when they were you know, sneaking in. I think somebody got their arm cut off, if I recall. And what's the point of kidnapping somebody that when they come to break him out, mm -hmm. you don't say, hey, don't come any closer. Or we're going to do something to him. Yeah. You just, oh, they're here. Well, let's leave him there and we'll fight him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's the point of kidnapping the guy? Because approach one requires acting, requ approach two just requires fighting. <laughs> and this is when we finally get the return of the cocaine ninjas. I honestly thought it, they were just a dropped subplot. 
and is this the fight that gets broken up by the cops or no? No, no, no that was, was later, I think. Okay. This is the one where the leader of where the brother is killed. Yeah. This is the one where the, he there's a standoff. All right, this on one that the one at night. The the yeah. that other one was one at day. Yeah, yeah. Right. This is the one at night. There's a standoff on a ledge. Uh, Jeff, the brother who is you know running the gang, falls to his death. Um, next scene, one of the leaders of the cocaine ninjas, you know, walks into the you know, the dojo, tells his the leader that his brother is dead. So Jeff. Jane's brother, a white guy, is the brother of the leader of and the, the Asian cocaine leader, the Asian leader of the cocaine ninjas. Um, maybe be metaphoric. I don't, yeah, that's that's what I assumed because, I mean, although I, can, I guess I now think of Orgasmo and the stunt cock and like. <laughs> I mean, they established earlier that Jim is half Korean and half black, um, but. Neither the the cocaine leader or or cocaine ninja leader or or Jeff looked you know mixed, so it was odd. Um, right, and their parents were supposed to be dead. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Um, so yeah, none of it made any sense. Yeah. Um, and then we get the resolution of the father. Uh, well, not the resolution of the father journey, but kind of the rank new wrinkle in it. Um, because you know Jim gets this. My piece of mail that tells him they found his father. A little continuity error there. Um, he goes out to get the uh, newspaper. No shirt. I, nobody outside of like classroom, you know, campus scenes. Nobody wears a shirt in this movie. It's Florida. Okay, I didn't think anything Florida. of it honestly. Okay, apparently that's a Florida <laughs> thing. Um, but he sets he pulls a newspaper and some letters out of the mailbox. Sets the news sets it all on the shelf on on the the door basically. That's now a, a little. You know, shelf opens the new, the letter. You know, starts screaming, "Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm gonna meet my father!" It cuts back to a wide shot. The newspaper's back in the mailbox. <laughs> Just a nice little continuity error there. And of course, as soon as you find out, you know, he he's gonna meet his father. He's dead meat. <laughs> right. Although you never can tell with this because it's just you know. Well, what of course it really happens at the end. Um, do we want to spoil? Um, let's. I mean, I this is know. yeah. Let's... It is one of the funniest. It is one of the funniest damn lines in the movie, actually. But okay, uh, well, okay. I mean, it's a happy ending. He survives. I'm, I'll, I'll say that much. Um, but because there's not Jim much was of a lucky. Build-up. Yeah. <laughs> But, the doctor so comes out and says, "Jim was lucky," and it's, it's yeah. like, "Wait, what?" Um, but I had seen well, the alternate internal organs spew out. Yeah. You know? right. <laughs> like, oh, it was just a flesh wound, and and laid there for what, like an hour that way, Something while like they that. were killing the rest of the ninjas. Well, while John yes. and, and Mark were killing the rest of the ninjas. Um. But all, I, when I drove into the ninjas, all I kept thinking was the Blues Brothers. Yeah. But I wish they had done like a, you know, instead of a Nazis, I hate Illinois Nazis or ninjas. I hate Miami ninjas. The original and now alternate ending is what, where there ends with them rushing him to the hospital and he dies. Wow. That was the original ending. I had watched that before the movie. I couldn't remember if I had seen that separately as a clip or it kind of skimmed to the end of the movie because I don't care about spoilers. Yeah. So I thought he died. And I'm trying to figure out like, okay, how are they going to do this? I was actually really surprised when they, when he lived. Um, but you know, there's some, again, some nice gore as John and, and Mark are taking out the ninjas while, you know, Mark is, you know, laying there with his organs out, <laughs> you know, for ninjas, they do an awful lot of head-on fighting, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really think the, the fight choreography choreographer, um, I'm going to say YK Kim in this case, probably, um, understood how nin- ninjas work. <laughs> right. It's about sneaking. It's about taking cheap shots. Ninjas, by and large, were spies and mercenaries. Right. They were all about the stealth and the guerrilla warfare. 
Um, exactly. They are not going to go for a head-on fight like in this movie they did a hundred times. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, but again, some nice gore in that scene. Um, yes. Some of John's very kind of platoon-esque slow motion ah, screaming <laughs> with the sword shots were great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, he really acted the fuck out of those scenes. I loved it. Um, and then one of the underlings runs up to the cocaine leader, Ninja, ninja Leader, tells him they're all dead. And without a, without breathing, practically, the leader pulls out his sword, decapitates him. And then laughs. Yeah, that was brilliant. Because there, is, there like, isn't a beat. It's just... They're all dead. Boom. Off with his head. One more is dead. <laughs> and then why, uh, Mark Waikikim kills the cocaine ninja leader with a move that we saw during the solo. Oh, right. John was behind him with a knife, you know, miming like he was going to attack him. And he was. they were showing all these takedowns. One of the takedowns involves turning the knife on your attacker and jabbing them in the stomach. He does this to the leader. Foreshadowing in the solo. Mm -hmm. And then once somehow they get Jim to the hospital on time, even though they spent like <laughs> an hour killing ninjas while Jim's Jim guts were lucky. falling out. <laughs> he was lucky. <laughs> I, I, another one almost fell out of my goddamn chair. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Sequels and remakes. Oh, man. Never. They should never do a sequel or remake of this. Well, they can't really do sequels. Um, yeah, I would say <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it was remade, but nobody should. It's perfect as it is. I mean, you have to have like Will Ferrell and Zach Galifianakis or something. Yeah, like. yeah. But I mean, there was one dude that I thought was like Chris Farley from Beverly Hills Ninja, one of the like the heavy, the, the heavy uh, guy with the beard. Yeah, he reminds me of like twenty different people. There was a guy with like blonde hair and like almost a bowl cut though. Yeah. And I was like, is that Chris Farley? The heavy set guy, one of the one of the coke yes. runners, the heavy set guy with the yes. beard. Yeah, he reminds me of like twenty people I've seen like either on YouTube or like in real life. He's he's got just one of those faces. Um, I was surprised the one scene that got broken up by the cops because it was like this is Florida, you know? Mm -hmm. Were they breaking any laws in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> like, who would even call the cops? They were like in the middle of nowhere, yeah. <laughs> like in a junkyard or something. Right. Yeah. There was one fight. I think it was after. Yeah, it was after the the gun runner, the, the brother Jeff was killed. Yeah. They lured them into this other fight to get revenge. Um, incidentally, when they went the, to you know, um, to rescue, um, or in the in the big fight at the end when when Jim was almost killed, where the yeah. hell were the other two? Well, you see, I think there were only three martial artists there. I think the other guys were actual, well, one a couple musicians, and then you had, you know, Jack who was a, an actor. <laughs> You think Jack was the actor? None of the, he was not an actor. He didn't think he would have to do it. He was upset when he when his role was expanded. I saw a little interview with him. Um, um, my, uh, Angelo Gennati was a musician, but he was also a right. taekwondo student. He did some decent fighting. Um, Jack did some decent fighting too. Um, Joe Diamond, um, but they just weren't in that scene like they were in class or something. I'm, I, was, I just kind of figured they were in class. Um, <laughs> You're probably right. But yeah, it was just seemed odd. So, on to brains. On to brains. Like I said, it, I, I was original, originally it just squeaked by to get a recommendation, but the more I've talked about it, the more I've thought about it and looked into it, it's perfect. Like, you don't touch this movie. It's amazing as is. It's a five. Yeah, I agree totally. This is up there with The Room. This is up there with Breed. Uh, th this is an easy five because it is just... If you like bad movies, you will enjoy the fuck out of this. Because it's, I mean, the music's annoyingly bad, but that just adds to it. <laughs> it's a hilariously bad movie with really good fight scenes. Yes, that that too. The fight scenes are actually good. That's very, it's very strange. You're kind of like, wait, what are we watching here? I mean, it's the same movie, though, where he goes to, like, tell a woman that he's killed her brother. and. Yeah. 
then they start making out like right. shortly thereafter. Right. So, so what have we learned? Uh, laugh all you want, but I bet David Lee Roth worked breaking bricks and wood into his act too. Oh, I'm sure. Um, and I learned that ninjas only care about money. I have all a second. Hmm? All about the money. Yeah. I have a second. What have I learned that you kind of um, turned me against there for a second? I'm talking about it's a Florida thing, but I just, I love how I worded this. Being a martial arts rock star means never having to wear a shirt. <laughs> oh, I also have another thing that I learned too. Um, in Florida, more people have swords than guns. Actually, from what I've heard about Florida, that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I didn't learn that from this. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I kind of knew that. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> but only one person actually had a gun in this movie. Right, right. You've heard, you know, you, there's that gag, you know, I studied the blade. But a shit ton of evil had swords, that's for sure. You know, it's, it's that meme, you know, while you were doing whatever, I studied the blade. Florida <laughs> is the embodiment of that meme. Oh, yeah. And that's it for Miami Connection. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Star Crash. This is our Christopher Plummer tribute. Yes, Christopher Plummer did a lot of amazing movies. He was a brilliant actor. But he only did, as far as I know, one that's in our wheelhouse. Hmm. So that's going to be the tribute. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There you are.